Hello, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Amethyst Ray Beaver. I am the co-curator of A Very Anxious Feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience, 20 Years of the Beth Burdine de Woody Collection. And I'm here today with Gisela Colon, who is going to share some information about, about her practice. Um, she's gonna take us on a, on a short pre-recorded studio visit. Um, and we're gonna talk about art history and art and um, all kinds of exciting things. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here today with you, Gisela. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Looking forward. Uh, yeah. I, um, I think that for anybody who's had an opportunity to um, to see your works in person, it, there's so much wonder that, you know, you look at it and you feel your own body and space in a different way. So I think that um, I think that the studio visit is in particular is going to help sort of give some shed, shed some light on some of the mystery that goes into actually making the work. So um, I look forward to asking some more questions about that and, and um, seeing a little bit more in the future. But I, I wanted to. Um, share a quick bio with everyone who has not who is not familiar with Gisela Colon's work. Um, Gisela Colon is a contemporary artist operating at the intersection of art and science, and is best known for meticulously creating light-activated sculptures through industrial and technological processes. Drawing from aerospace and other scientific realms, Colon utilizes innovative sculptural materials such as carbon fiber and optical materials of the 21st century to generate her energetic sculptures. Originally from Puerto Rico, Gisela Colon lives and works in Los Angeles. Her work is included in the permanent collections of LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, the Perez Art Museum, among others. And her work has been exhibited all across the United States, Europe, and in the Middle East. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we're going to share um, a quick studio tour with you, I think. Um, Everyone will enjoy it, and then we'll be back to to share more about um, about the about your practice. Let's do it. Hello, everybody. Here I am outside my studio in Duarte. Duarte is in eastern Los Angeles County, and you can see behind me the mountains. So it's a beautiful setting. And what a great day to be in California. And now I'm gonna take you inside the studio. And now we're walking inside the studio, which is a repurposed plastics factory. And there's Albert, my assistant. Albert is gonna open the oven. This is where we do a lot of our heat molding. And as you can see, it's a nice, beautiful industrial oven. We use it all the time. going into the oven. We're baking. You can view part of the process as to how we sculpt and mold the acrylic material to create my wall works, which I call generally pods. So here you can see a mold created out of wood, plywood, that has been sculpted to tool the plastic material, tool the acrylic as we call it, and now we're going to be pumping air into the mold and this process is called blow molding. And now you can see how the air will be pressuring the material downward and forming the apex of the sculpture. The air goes through the valve, goes through the top of the tool or mold into various holes and the air is evenly spread out throughout the mold so that it evenly sculpts the plastic material. And now the air blowing process is complete.
and we maintain the pressure of the air until the plastic hardens into place, which could take another 10, 15 minutes before it hardens. And then after that, it is released from the mold and it goes into further processing. And now we're on the other side of the factory where my other assistant, Robert, is going to demonstrate how we join and prepare the sculpture after it gets formed in the oven. can see there's lots of the molds that are these wooden structures that I utilize to create my work and these are my aerospace monoliths which have been installed in various locations some prototypes here's my fluorescent acrylic table that I designed where we do a lot of our sketching and thinking. My aerospace monoliths are rendered of carbon fiber, which allows me to create seamless sculptures that have no corners, no lines, no demarcations, no place for the eye to rest, which creates a singular unified form that contains inherent movement. These are the parabolic monoliths which oscillate from side to side because their base has the shape of an ellipse which creates the duality and the polarity of opposites in these objects. And here's a prototype of a 50 foot work that I would like to create and I'm studying the feasibility of it. And then continuing on to this side of the studio, we see several wall works that are gonna be going into various exhibitions. And installed on the wall is one of my new rectanguloids, which is a new series of flattened wall works, but they still contain multiple layers inside, which creates the magic and mysterious glow the reflection and the refraction of light. And I'm really excited about this new series, which is gonna be exhibited at Gavilac Gallery in Palm Beach the first week of December. And here's some other wall works earmarked for a museum exhibition, a solo show opening in February. And I wanna show you guys this new series, these thin, long works are called perihelions because they observe the shape of the pathway of a comet and the perihelion is the closest point to the sun in the orbit of the comet and then also here are the periastrons which are similar pathway shaped works so the perihelions relate to the closest point to the sun, and then the periastrons relate to the closest point to a star, which is further beyond the realm of our solar system. So these works have a real cosmological feel to them, and they're inspired by the mysteries of the universe. And here you observe one of my acrylic monoliths, which is the second monolith that I created of that nature. The first one is in the exhibition at the Taubman. So that was the very first acrylic monolith I made. And then I jumped over to the aerospace technology. And then here we see one of my unidentified object works that is titled Hyperbolic Monolith. And these hyperbolic monoliths have a lot of 
action inside and kind of movement and they're translucent and they oscillate in tones but they're very very subtle so this one oscillates between kind of a pinkish tone and a green vibe kind of cosmological realm and they're eight feet tall and they also address kind of the mysteries of the cosmological realm which it's an area that I've leaned to more and more over the years because I'm really attracted to phenomena that's beyond ourselves and beyond our earth and beyond the solar system. So it was a real pleasure to have you all visit the studio today. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And since this is a Latin X exhibition, I have to say, muchísimo saludo a la gente de Puerto Rico. Aquí mi gente representando a Puerto Rico en Los Ángeles y batiendo cobre por ustedes. So, for today, instead of having just talking heads, I thought it would be nice to have a series of images as we go through the conversation so that, um, you know, visuals that accompany words are so much more meaningful in terms of getting ideas across. So um, without further ado, let's start with the installation view here at the Taubman Museum of Art of the ex exhibition, A Very Anxious Feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience, 20 Years of the Beth Rudin de Woody Collection. And I want to thank Beth for acquiring my piece. That was, it was the very first monolith I ever made. So thank you, Beth, for, for believing in me. And Cindy Peterson, the director of the museum, um, Amethyst Beaver, the co-curator, Eva Thornton, um, Laura Dvorkin, and Maynard Monroe. Hi, Maynard. Hi, Laura, who basically are co-curators at the Beth Rudin de Woody collection. So it's really, um, I'm just really grateful to be in the exhibition and it's very meaningful to be among such an amazing group of artists. And just it's just reflective of the incredible diversity that the Latinx community has out there. So um, here we are, that's my monolith. And just to give a little bit of background before we jump into the formal aspects of my work, I thought I'd give you um, just an overview of my, my background and my heritage. I grew up in San Juan, Puerto Rico, as you see on the map, which is a tropical island in the Caribbean. Here's um, old San Juan and it's a very kind of, you know, has a lot of cultural heritage. And this is a, a walled city of old San Juan with El Morro Fort, as you see in the tip. Um, incredible Spanish colonial architecture, really rich color palette in old San Juan. And it has, incredible flora and fauna. And this is, you see here, a picture of El Yunque rainforest, which is just brimming with life and power. And I used to go there a lot as a child. And it was, it's been very kind of embedded in my work, this whole sense of the power of life that I grew up around with me on the island. Here are La Cueva de Camuy, which are these incredible Kamui cave rock formations that really give you a sense of the passage of geological time on the planet versus human time. So I, I grew up with the sense of time as kind of a, a very important function because, you know, we lose track in our lives. We always think that um, our lives are so meaningful, but the reality is when you look at the earth and you look at the geology, you know, there's been so many billions of years that came before us that it really makes you stop and think about your own existence. And Puerto Rico has this thing when you're on the ground, you feel very kind of connected to the earth, attached to the earth, because you have low skies, which is the opposite of Los Angeles. And the quality of the light and the sense of earth is really kind of prevalent. There's also ecological wonders, like here you see La Bahia Fosforescente de Lajas, which is a bioluminescent bay, which has these microscopic creatures that light up at night. And it's just a fantastic experience to be in that water, which is kind of brimming with biological diversity. You know, there's lots of sea creatures that abound like jellyfish or aguavivas, how they're called in Puerto Rico. And 
um, plants too. Like I grew up with this, this little plant is called Mori Vivi, which means I lived and I died. And when you touch it, the leaves close up immediately. And it's kind of a prehistoric plant, which is really cool. And I remember playing with it a lot as a child. Um, Coqui, which is the native um, little frog of Puerto Rico, which cannot live anywhere outside the island and has a beautiful little song at night that it sings. So I grew up with lots of, of an abundance of, you know, animals and plants. Here I am at the age of four with my um, rooster, El Gallo Claudio, which, you know, basically I just was surrounded by life in every, in every way. And I also painted a lot with my mother. You know, she was a painter. And this is just an example here. I am at the age of six with one of the paintings that we created of the sugarcane fields and the, and the harvest of the sugarcane. So it was a lot of impasto and use of, you know, oil paints and, and uh, wood and canvas. And then eventually um, I went to University of Puerto Rico, graduated from the UP, Universidad de Puerto Rico Recinto de Rio Piedras, and I studied economics and a minor in political science with a focus on Latin American political science. And then I moved to LA, here we are, huge metropolis, completely the opposite of Puerto Rico. So these, these are kind of the two locations that have influenced me the most in my work. So it's kind of really a hybrid, it's a combination um, of this expanded energy that the city of Los, Los Angeles has and the sense of movement on the freeways. Everybody's always kind of with this peripatetic energy of growth and constant fluctuation and movement. And what's amazing about Los Angeles is that it was really born kind of in the 60s with the whole sense of, you know, defined by the space age aesthetic and the availability of new materials and technologies was really important for artists because um, the newly declassified substances after World War II became then available commercially to anybody who wanted to use them. And so artists kind of latched on to this, this new age aesthetic to create new art that hadn't really been done before. And so I think I'm kind of in that continuum and that trajectory of new kind of aerospace and space age materials. And um, just the whole um, aerospace industry is very prevalent in Southern California. And my monoliths are created with that technology, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And the other thing about the California um, landscape that I love is this incredible sense of open space that you get out in the desert, where the sky, it just feels like it's alive, and it creates a real feeling of transcendence and pursuit of the sublime, which you see in a lot of the artwork that is emanating from the West Coast. And also the sky has a sense of presence and of atmosphere that kind of that in, creates the sense of connection to the landscape and it reminds us of our own mortality. And again, that feeling of contrasting geological time with human time and our lifespan. And there's a feeling of silence when you're out there and you can connect to the vastness of the universe. Humans can connect to the earth, the sky, and that metaphysical quality it exists in life out in the West. And for example, artists like Agnes Pelton, which is right now, they, she has an incredible show with the Whitney. Agnes Pelton being the original desert transcendentalist, that's where all of the kind of the West Coast ethos and the West Coast philosophy of art making really comes from is that sense of transcendence with the land. And here's a picture of my work. Now we're gonna get a little bit more into the specifics of the work. And basically I have two general bodies of work or principal bodies of work, which are my wall works, which are um, kind of these glowing orb-like pods, and then also standalone, standalone monoliths, which you see here, which are, these are parabolic monoliths. And, um, they really embody the underpinning and all of my work is this concept of energy transfer, of movement, of life, of qualities of change and transformation that pervade the space outside of the sculpture. And yeah, here's a little bit more of a, of a closer view of some of the monoliths in conjunction with the pods. 
And here we're back into the Taubman Museum installation view. And what an incredible show this is, Ameth. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the premise of the show. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's so nice to, to see images because I'm, I don't get to be there on a regular basis with it. That's sort of, you know, when you get, to, usually when you curate a show, not in COVID times, you get to live with it for a while. You get to spend time um, in, in the exhibition space. But but this one, I, I haven't had as much time as I want to. But um, but so a, a little bit about the exhibition, the, the title, A Very Anxious Feeling, Voices of Unrest in the American Experience, is not, it's not just about anxiety. There's a lot, obviously, about anxiety. Um, so, you know, a lot of what we're thinking about today, most of the artists in this exhibition are contemporary artists. There are a few that are from the past 30 years, but the majority of the work has been made in the past three to five years. So it's it's really, really new work. Um, but it, it really became clear in, in looking at, um, at the works in the Beth Rudin DeWoody collection that we wanted to have a conversation that wasn't, it wasn't, it was a lot about anxiety. There's a lot about what's happening on to the planet, what's happening in politics, what's happening in labor. Um, a lot of reasons for us to, <laughs> Be, especially with COVID and upcoming election and um, fights for racial equity and racial justice. Um, but then they're, they're looking at your work to tell it that it was like a balm. It was, and you talk about energy being transferred. And it was, I, I loved how you even described your own work as sort of being um, a catalyst or, or, or a form in which it could transmute these negative feelings, these, these, this anxiety into something so positive and beautiful. And I think um, I love this particular image because you um, you are confronted very, you know, very intentionally with with your um, with your sort of transforming, soothing balm. And then um, in that on that first wall, that is um, Farley Aguilar's um, patriarchy. So, you know, you can kind of see just from just from this image that there are a lot of um, a lot of conversations that are taking place, but um, one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you and to, to you know to share more was because I think that especially in this moment we need to we need to have something something that feels hopeful, a guiding light in in this time. Um, and I you know and I just think that your 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 work and how it ties into art history um, is really addressing so many of the themes um, of the exhibition um, and literally transforming them into something. Um, into something really special when you walk into it. I also just have to say, because people who who haven't had a chance to see your work in person, you're um, standing in front of it. It's like a very visceral, very physical experience because as you walk around, you, you, you see it differently. It literally changes your point of view. And, um, and that feels that feels really important right now that you know, we have to have these things in our lives that make us literally shift our own points of view, our bodies, and just to see something different, see something new. So that was something that um, that, it, that a picture just can't quite um, can't quite capture, but is, is really important, I think, when when thinking about your work, Sola. So it's it's extremely special. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, you know, for me, there's different ways of connecting to to people, you know, mm -hmm. and so the way I see my work is that under the rubric of minimalism. Now that's a label of convenience, really, you know, because the work is very complex, but for, for placing it in the in the trajectory of the art canon, I think minimalism was a good entry point for me. And what I like about it is that it can connect and speak to anyone. You don't need to know the history of art. You don't need to know a particular narrative or a particular context. The The encounter with the work is really visceral and primal, and that's what I love, that when I create my work, there is no concrete message. The existence of the work itself is the message, that here's a woman and of Latin origin that can tackle this, and tackle this realm of minimalism, which is very much white and patriarchal, and, and make something new and different and springboard off of that kind of very rigid canon where there were very few women before and make something that can be universally accessible to all and, and, and become a positive force of change and transformation of energy and to uplift us. Because I think that in the end of the day, that's what art is really about. It should be something that could uplift the human race as a whole. 
So that's where I'm coming from. And I'm re just really excited to then continue sharing a little bit more about the work. So like you were just saying, Amethyst, that the work changes. So here you can see that here, this is a view um, with all of the lights turned off after hours at the museum. And as you can see, the piece kind of then glows just in a very different way, that underglow that makes it feel like it's lifelike and alive. And then as you move around it, this is a, a prior installation image, but you see how there's a complete color shift. And then also the form starts changing as you move around the, the sculpture. And then when you get completely to the other side, the glow has transformed itself into like this deep kind of ultraviolet blue. And when you're perpendicular to the sculpture, you just, the color almost has gone completely and it becomes this kind of invisible vessel. And this, the, you see the black line that is bisecting it? Mm -hmm. That's very much about perceptualism in the West. Like John McLaughlin, famous painter, basically created his paintings so that your eyes would bisect, so to speak. So there's two sides to the painting and it's, it's kind of a perceptual illusion. So I was kind of, you know, harking on that with this sculpture as you know, it's transformative in every way in form and color, but also in just the energetic impulse and all this fluid color spectrum, the history of it for me, um, you know, comes from, Latin American op art originally, because these were the artists that I latched onto um, when I first started my aut autodidactic um, learning. And it was Carlos Cruz Diez, and he's infamous for his physichromies, which are color additive and, and, and retractive um, objects that as you move around them, you see the color shifting, but his colors were very defined. So you can see where let's say green ends and orange begins. and um, there's not, there, they weren't as fluid. And I also, of course, Jesus Rafael Soto, who's famous for his um, penetrables, it's just movement tied to color. So the whole concept of movement in the artwork tied to the, to the feeling of color and how you experience color in your body. And on the West Coast minimalist, of course, you have James Terrell, where you have a series, you know, just light that kind of merges and becomes fluid with color. And you know, Dan Flavin, East Coast minimalist. And here Flavin, of course, uses light, specifically the tubes. And when the tubes emit the light, then it becomes merged and you see a color spectrum. But all of these artists basically, um, you know, you still could see defined areas of color. And the most seminal artist for me in terms of color theory was when I started studying Donald Judd. This is a picture that I just took a couple of weeks at his MoMA retrospective and Judd believe it or not was a colorist an incredible colorist and for many many decades he was overlooked that way I believe because he was lumped in with um, you know this whole idea that minimalism of the East Coast was really devoid of color and just all about material that had no that had no change and no ability to transform you know it's very rigid mm -hmm. and in 1993, one of the last pieces of writing that he did before he passed away was this essay on color theory. And he talks about two color monochromes and monochrome triads. So he would pair two or three colors together and he would say, well, this is a monochromatic experience for me because of the way he paired them. And he talks about these multicolored works and he says, I want all of the colors to be present at once. I didn't want them to combine. I wanted a multiplicity all at once that I had not known before. Mm -hmm. So I springboarded off of this Judd color theory and I developed a theory of my own where you can have multiple colors present at once, but I wanted mine to combine. I wanted them to become fluid. I wanted them to become merged with the light and I wanted them to form multiple hues and values that were hard to pin down and are, were very mutable and indeterminate and constantly in flux. And so that led me to create what I call my fluid color spectrum, which here's just a short little clip. Um, Anna, I don't know if you can play yours because it's better resolution. Um, a short little clip of the sculpture. So you can see as you move around the object, how you can achieve the experience of this fluid color spectrum.
And we should also note that there's no, there's no electronics in these. There's no actual light inside of them. No, there's no artificial light. So that is, that's how it gets distinguished from, you know, so Dan Flavin mm -hmm. or Terrell in which they're using electricity or bulbs to, to create the color. Whereas this is just intrinsic. It, it interacts with the environmental light that's out there and it goes through the various layers and creates this refraction and this reflection and results in the fluid color spectrum. That's cool. So, um, then after the wall works, I basically started working with creating these standalone monoliths. And this is the first aerospace monolith that I made. And basically I was kind of pushing the, the, the boundaries in terms of creating in a, what, what, what we would conceive as a minimal object that had no lines, no corners, no demarcations, no 90 degree angles, no places for the eye to rest so that it was just a really singular form that could embody movement in the sense that as you move around it, it's so fluid, you know, you don't, you don't see where it, kind of finishes, like the finish is completely slippery. And this is this piece actually is in the collection of LACMA and it's gonna be exhibited next year on a touring exhibition of light, space and surface of works in the LACMA collection of, that address this kind of philosophy of minimalism of the West Coast. And this these monoliths are what I call my projectile monoliths and they have a circular base and they feel like a projectile but the most important thing to take away from this is how I want to transform what originally is imagery that feels aggressive, masculine, causes harm like projectiles, bullets, missiles, rockets, and transform them by giving them this incredible surface into aesthetically desirable objects that basically come from a place of female power a desire to take this masculine negative energy and can convert it to female strength and just addressing kind of phenomenology and just things of the earth that are basically transcending um, the physical material. And so after the projectile monolith, monolith, I developed the parabolic monolith. This one was exhibited in Saudi Arabia. It's um, 25 feet tall and their base is elliptical. So you get a little bit more of a, of a shape shifting going on because on one angle, the monolith is wider and then it kind of gets skinnier as you move around it. And these really, again, are transmuting positive energy into the world. That's how I see it. So was this the first time that you um, installed these works outside? Yes, this was the first time. I exhibited them previously at, at various museum exhibitions, but this one was the first one where it went into the land and it was really incredible for me because that's kind of its original intent in a way is to be able to show it in communion with its environment in communion with the, the sunlight. And here, for example, the sun is setting and the angle of the light activates the sculpture. So throughout the day, it fluctuates depending on the, the sunlight and it, and it also becomes, um, completely muted at certain hours, you know, because it's like there's no sun at all and then it becomes a reflection of its environment and you can see that I'm gonna show it in a little bit, there's a few slides of that. But anyway, the history of these monoliths goes back, they, it really is a long history of like cultural artifacts, structures and, and, and architecture that predates kind of history. So here you have, for example, Stonehenge, you know, these giant monolithic natural forms that exist. You have um, Egyptian obelisks, mm -hmm. Roman columns, like here Pompey's pillar and Trajan's column. And even the pyramids themselves, which are kind of really monolithic in the fact that they're a unitary shape. And so there's this whole line of prehistorical and historical um, structures and architecture that they reference um, and their connection to the land. And um, Anna, I don't know if you wanna play this video um, that shows how it, it's incorporated into the earth. Let's see, there we go. Yeah, so you see this incredible sense of 
history that this land possesses. This is a canyon in Saudi Arabia, which was closed to Western civilization for thousands and thousands of years. And it actually was part of the spice trade route many, many, many eons ago. So it's just being in this context and having a sculpture that addresses not only the past, but the present and the future was really, really special. It was very meaningful to have, be able to have that dialogue with, you know, these structures of geological time that are all surrounding the sculpture and bringing it into the moment, the present time. Absolutely. It's, I mean, they're, it's otherworldly in any space, but specifically when you put them in nature, they just, it makes, it makes me think about the images you showed earlier of the bioluminescent bay of the stars in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this wonder of the natural world already around us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's interesting. And then, you know, looking at Stonehenge, of course, like that makes so much sense. Um, and then, you know, placing these within the desert also feels so um, so intentional, you know, within recent art history, um, thinking about land art as well. So I just, I love, I love how this pulls into so many different things that you've, you've shared with right, us. Right, right. You know, there's the, yeah, and there's that juxtaposition between the, the kind of that future, that feeling of futurism that you get with the past. So it's just waking you up. It's saying, look how time passes and civilizations change and just it's just kind of a beacon of like hey wake up and just let's just see what the future holds you know and not getting stuck you know absolutely so in terms of the the past modern uh uh you know references to modern times and the the, the particularly the western art historical canon you you know i find certain precedents that are monolithic like richard Serra's east west installation in qatar um, this is the LACMA rock. I think that's Michael Govan there, petting the rock or cleaning the rock. And then that rock, which was chosen from Mike, Michael Heiser chose it because it was such a fantastic monolithic rock. And then it's been installed now at LACMA and people can walk under it. So it's like the only sculpture in the world, I understand that um, you can actually walk underneath the sculpture. That's really cool. I didn't know that either. It's a wonderful example, again, of this, this that that humans are drawn to the earth and these massive kind of mon monolithic forms. And here's Michael Heiser in his ongoing project called the city, which you can't, you can't get to see yet. It's still not finished. He's been working on it for, for over four decades, but I mean, wow. look incredible. These, these um, geometric forms are formed from the land itself. So he would mix rocks and cement that he would take from the earth and create this, this kind of giant monolithic city. So, so yeah, and it's so great when, when it finally opens um, to be able to go see it. And here we have Nancy Holt with, um, again, these monolithic tubes that have a conversation with the cosmological and the sun. They line up with the sun at certain times of the day, and they really have that connection to the world beyond. And um, Robert Smithson, Smithson's Spiral Jetty, which I visited, and it's incredible its sense of movement and dynamic, you know, it's a mutable earthwork because the, the, the water rises and falls and the salt grows and then disappears. And so you really have change and transformation in a minimal earthwork, which is fantastic, you know? Yeah. Here's one of the pictures um, of it when the water was higher up and the salt is all over the rocks and growing on top of the rocks, like, you know, crystal salt and look at the color of the water. So it's the reflection, it's incredible, huh? Yeah, I've never seen a picture of it, of it like this. This is really cool. Yeah, it's really magical the way that the, the because there's so much, so many minerals in the water, the, the, it, it acts as a prism. And then you get the reflection and the refraction of light and, and you get completely amazing color hues surrounding the rocks. And here's James Terrell uh, Volcano, the Rodan Crater, which is also an amazing monolithic structure that he's been working on for decades, his magnum opus, another, another place that um, we can't wait to go to experience that gets completed. Um, and then Donald Judd's concrete boxes. They're, they're 15 concrete works um, set out in the Shinati Foundation, which it speaks to me. I mean, I just love these concrete works. They're so massive and they have so much weight and they're, they're just 
again, an amazing juxtaposition with the earth. Here are his um, 100 milled aluminum boxes that are right indoors from the concrete boxes when you go to Shanadi. And these, again, I've been there many times and they always uh, amaze me in terms of how the light from the outside interacts with the sculptures and causes all of this dynamic energy to flow, very contrary to what people think minimalism is. So Judd, I mean, I just heart Judd. Yeah. <laughs> and um, here's my, my good friend, Dwayne Valentine, his 12 foot um, majestic resin columns, which are just fantastic. These were at a, a David's Werner show about five years ago. And um, of course, John McCracken's reflective columns, which, you know, kind of reflect the environment around them and then incorporate it into the sculpture. Mm -hmm. Robert Irwin's first prismatic column from 1967, which was cast acrylic as opposed to milled acrylic. And I mean, look at this beauty in terms of it's just monolithic form, how it interacts with the light almost mm -hmm becomes invisible from some Yeah, I love how it disappears. It's the opposite of, 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 a, of a traditional monolith, right? Which I think is also kind of what is interesting um, when thinking about your work. It's, it's definitely echoing those forms, but it also feels in some ways like a deconstruction of these traditional so, forms. So these, this is a long history that I'm gonna go through and then we're gonna springboard off and talk about how I deconstructed and changed it, the right. discourse. And I'm gonna throw in this Doug Wheeler synthetic desert installation that was at the Guggenheim because of the silence, because again, it evokes the sense of the earth and just the, the complete minimal aspect of the, of the light and the color. It just was fantastic to be in there for 30 minutes with no sound, it was completely devoid of sound. And here we get to the few female pioneers that tackled minimalism early on and Truett, East Coast minimalist. and. Um, she was always segregated from all of the other minimalists, you know, from, from Judd, from, from, from everybody because of rhetoric that Greenberg preferred her because her, her columns were painted. And for some reason he tried to say, well, I'm okay because they're painted because he couldn't get off of this whole painting thing. You know, he had a hard time with minimalism. And so she was segregated out and because her columns were hand painted and the titles of them, were kind of nature oriented. So I don't think she was ever given, you know, the gravitas and the heft that some of the men received um, just because they used more industrialized materials. So I, I started studying and just realizing the injustice of, of, of with women, what, with, with what women had experienced with this whole movement of minimalism. And here on the West Coast, um, you have Helen Pashtian who created this incredible installation at LACMA of these light columns. and um, you know, again, Helen and then my friend Mary, uh, Mary Course, who does, um, you know, these color shifting uh, paintings, they were the only two West Coast minimalists historically. And they never really, um, I don't think they ever felt comfortable with the term feminism or referencing any sort of content in their work whatsoever, or even identity. It was simply like, we just have to make work that fits in with what the men are doing. And so I observed that. I mean, I'm not being critical one way or the other. I'm just saying this is just what I observed as a, as a fact, you know? Yeah. And, um, and then after that, we had um, even Judy Chicago. Well, not after that. In the 60s, Judy Chicago, there she is, did a bunch of um, minimal work. And she talks about this openly about how she felt like she had to make work that would fit in with the men. And she was married to Lloyd Hamrell and Lloyd Hamrell made a lot of these blocks kind of, these are hers, but Lloyd Hamrell made similar blocks that you see here on the, on the right side of the screen. And she felt like she had to take all content out of the work. And here above on the left side of the screen, you see her three domes. She did a whole series of three dome, uh, which the, she exhibited at the Pasadena Art Museum. This, these, are, these pieces are 1968. And if you see behind me, let me see on the other side here, I have uh, a set of Judy's three domes from 1968, these small iridescent gold domes, which I love. And they're so special to me and so meaningful because it's sort of like, I see hidden message in them. I say like, hey, they're feminine and they're soft and they're 
you know, even though they were automotive paint that she used, and she was actually the only woman who studied automotive painting. That's amazing. Um, amongst like 250 men that were studying how to paint cars, and she was the only one. So she she was able to penetrate that world of the men um, successfully. And it wasn't until 1970, I believe, that she finally decided, you know what, I'm going to express myself in what the way I really want to. Like she grew up and was able to express herself um, as a feminist. And she's been pretty influential, particularly her atmospheres. These were um, a series of smoke works that she did out in the California desert in the early 70s. And she's recreated some of these works um, in the last five years or so. But her purpose in doing this was to soften the environment and put a feminine impulse out into the world. And so this was really an important concept for me because I thought, you know what, with my monolith, I want to take and soften the environment. So even though they're a masculine form that is extremely kind of strong and it has this connotations of, of masculinity and strength, I juxtapose it with this iridescent finish that is reminiscent of Judy's atmosphere. So you're taking this color and this fluid kind of color spectrum and you're putting it out there in the world to create the softening and this this dichotomy is, is how I could explain it. You know, it's a real juxtaposition of form and surface. So here you see the same monolith at different lighting. So this on the left side, you see at the end of the day when the sun has left or is almost gone and it becomes a transmitter of less like this grisaille reflection of the environment. So you see the mountains um, kind of reflected in the work. And then when the sun completely sets, you can add artificial lighting, which we did here on the right for an event. And then it becomes kind of this kind of otherworldly kind of glow. So it, it that whole power of transformation and fluctuation occurs all throughout while the sculpture's out in the world. But it really derives from the sense of feminizing the world. So in that sense, you know, the work is different. And also I would count as a, for a, 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 you know, a, a precedent as Linda Banglis, who did this incredible, oops, sorry, liquid amorphous forms. Hold on, I lost my place there. Yeah, Linda Banglis, which I love. And also even Yayoi Kusama's tentacles. I mean, look how full of life and, and vibrancy um, yeah, Yoi Kusama, and she was actually very early on, she was a really good friend with Donald Judd, and he really respected her when she did her accumulation series, which were full of just these white little protuberant, phallic protuberances that she would fill an entire chair or entire object with these protuberances. And he deemed that, he put her in, in his specific objects essay because he said, that's a specific object. You know, it's the repetition of something becomes singular. And so she's kind of an early proto-minimalist, if you will. Mm -hmm. And um, so now you know where the monolith kind of originated from. Um, it's been a long trajectory of my life, living in different geographical locations, as well as studying the art history and seeing where I kind of fit in and springboard off of. Um, but there's one more dimension I just want to mention, which is the future. And that comes from the cosmological energy transfer down to the atomic particles that are contained inside our cells. Even our DNA, if you look at it, has this incredible kind of cyclical spiral forms that are twirling inside of us. So like we even have fluid geometry inside of us, you know, mm -hmm. and macroscopically, I've always looked at not only the micro, but the macro, which is the forces of the universe, universe around us, the cosmological realm, and here you have the laws of physics, like in action, when you, you go beyond, beyond the earth and you look at how, you know, the planets rotate around the sun, the pathway of the comets, everything invisible and mysterious out there in the world contains this energy. And that's what I look for in my sculpture. I feel like I want to imbue my sculpture with a little bit of this energy that's out there that's invisible, but yet it permeates everything around us. And you know, when you look at outer space, it's just everything is just so magic and mysterious. And I want to capture a little bit of that in my work. So the bottom line is that my work, as I see it, is tackling the universal. And it's democratic in the sense that 
anybody can access that energy. And I'm just so happy to be able to have been present, be able to present my work in this exhibition. So thank you, Amethyst. And um, that's, I'll leave you guys with that thought of like pursuing the universal that we can all connect with. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I have a, I have a few questions if you um, if you have some time, and and then because this is a pre recorded conversation, if there are additional questions um, that you, that our viewers have for Gisela, you can um, send them to the Tabman Museum of Art. We'll include a link um, with the video, and we'll we'll send those um, those questions. If you know if we can't answer them, um, then we'll we'll forward them on to Gisela. But um, but you know, looking at so many of these um, permanent land artworks, the, I, I, I guess I, I think I know the answer. The the work that was in Saudi Arabia that is no longer on view. Is that correct? Well, that was a temporary exhibition. Okay. And have you have you thought about permanent ones? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I, you answer answer. Please do. I I don't mean to interrupt. So that the Saudi Arabia was a temporary installation of a few months in which all these artists. I think we were like, was it? 15 of us were each given specific locations in that amazing canyon. And um, it was just, you know, very, I mean, it was all documented, but eventually the work has to come down because they're really trying to keep the canyon um, untouched, you know, and there will be other exhibitions. I understand that there, like maybe every few years they're going to have a contemporary exhibition, but it was what an amazing experience, you know, to be. In when, when did that happen? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The beginning of 2020. Oh my God, that it feels so long ago. Yeah, it was just right before COVID. <laughs> so it was. Have you? Um, yeah, no, that that is. I mean, that I, it's it, obviously we can't travel. We and it was it's already come down. But is it is it part of your your thoughts for the future to create installations in Los Angeles or outside Los Angeles in more works in nature? Absolutely. I'm sure other opportunities will present themselves to continue that dialogue with the earth. Yeah, I, I just love that. And then in terms of permanence, I mean, I think that a lot of the, the works we were looking at, um, the land art works, you know, Spiral Jetty and Donald Judd's um, uh, concrete sculptures, they're not leaving anytime soon. Have you, I, But I think a lot of your work is also rooted in this idea of impermanence. Um, do you, have you thought about that and thinking about, you know, creating a permanent versus impermanent installation and where, yeah. you know. I have, I have um, being inspired by Judd Shinati, I have, um, a specific idea of what I want to do out in the California desert. Eventually I want to have a location there where I can have permanent installations. So that's kind of in the works in my mind and uh, planning for the future. Yeah. I love that. I think that sounds like a really magical, um, magical experience. I mean, I, I guess I say that because, you know, Seeing it in a in a in a museum space is in and of itself magical, and you know I just I can only imagine what it's like to to be in it in in you know the majesty of nature, um, and you know so so tied to the cosmological. I, I mean even that para, parabolic um, figure was was replicated in in, um, in like a rainbow form on it, when it when it was reflected um, in the, the the monolith in in Saudi Arabia, which is I mean so amazing. Yeah. No, there's the, the endless possibilities for the future. And so I'm planning on it. So oh, the ones that we, you know, we, we saw in the, um, in the studio visit and, um, and the ones that obviously were installed in exhibitions, there's there, they look so perfect and also organic at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about the past, like chance, like how, how chance plays a role in, in what you create, because do you, do you know exactly what's going to come out every time um, no, you open no. up the? Well, backing up to the beginning, um, it, I had a eureka moment when I discovered how to make these works because obviously it, 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 there were these materials that I started putting together and looking at them on the floor, and I and I started layering things and letting the light hit through, and and one day I got something to glow back at me, and I said, oh my god this is really special. Maybe I should pursue this line of inquiry with these materials. And that was my Eureka moment that led me on the pathway to making these, um, you know, these glowing wall works. And so, no, I, I cannot plan specifically for the color because each layer is formed separately. And that's part of the secret juice that I say. <laughs> each layer gets formed separately and then each layer gets you know, structured one on top of the other. And then it depends on how the light is going to hit it 
that will eventually create the color. So over time, yeah, I've developed some predictability that I know if I combine certain things with others, I'll result in this color versus that color. And it's been a long but really, really fun process of being able to, to achieve that. Yeah, I think that's, you, you use the word fun, and I actually think that, that that's something that maybe gets glossed over. And I know I, I personally am really interested in the idea of, of joy and, and humor, but fun is something that I, I like, I, I don't, it, it comes off as something that's like, you know, not serious in art, but there's something so fun. And I mean that in the best way possible when I see, when, you know, when I get to interact with your work and I, and, and that comes through, like you, there's clearly this, this, um, this joy of experimentation, this, you know, this joy in, in pulling from all of these, this historical and natural experiences that is really fun. I mean, is that something that you're thinking about? Absolutely. I cannot believe how happy I am when I get to go to my studio and as I see it, have fun. You know, it's really, for me, this is work. Being an artist isn't work. This is a process of just, like you say, just being joyful and coming up with new ideas. It's so, it's, it's kind of like you get your mind on fire on something. Like you, you just feel so alive when I'm creating. And recently, one of the funnest experiences I've had, believe it or not, is in the commercial realm a little bit. I got hired by Christian Dior to design um, some of their Lady Dior bags. And I had so much fun. I said, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this, you know, yeah. <laughs> because it was just a fantastic experience of creativity and having that flow in yeah. your mind. So, well, I love that. I mean, even in, even with a bag, then it, you're you're actually sending out your your work into the world, you know, to to conquer different spaces that you know fine quote fine art um, yeah. is, is not allowed to do. So I I love that. I mean, it's also a continuation of your breaking down these these strict boundaries and strict barriers. Right, right. Which is really again, it's about accessibility to all to have everybody experience it in different ways. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you talked a little bit about feminism and uh, and um, you know and and then and, and how you're sort of feminizing the world too. And I mean, as much as you love Judd, you're also in some ways um, you know picking it apart a little bit and kind of drawing you know some questions about sort of this art history, art historical boundaries and um, and and uh, and one of, and one of the things that we talked about in in preparation for this conversation was that you were really excited to be included as a Latinx artist in in this show and and I wanted to know if you could you know speak a little bit more to that like why um, you know so many feminists or so many uh, female artists who were working in minimalism for minimalism for so long really eschewed their identity as women in order to be accepted um, and that I don't think that's necessary in contemporary art now, although I, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit more about how identity is important to you and your work. Well, well, interesting because, you know, when I first started this practice was about seven years ago, and I became friends with some of these artists from the 60s, like Dwayne Valentine and Mary Course and Peter Alexander before he passed away. And I so I kind of was, it was really amazing to be, um, accepted by them first of all you know and i thought oh that's kind of you know this is so great that i get to time travel that i get to be with these people so my first venture was just being exposed to them and their ideals and then i started teaching myself more and more and reading and just learning about everything minimal and i realized oh my god there's like a dearth of identity here you mm -hmm. know there has been i hate to say but there has been whitewashing because it's just all has to fit into this pre you know, prescribed program um, mm -hmm. that was laid out in the 60s. And so I kind of took it as a challenge upon myself in a subversive kind of way. I said, well, you know what? I am going to springboard off of that and I'm going to try and create something new and different that basically speaks to me as a woman being able to deconstruct these, these pre-existing rigid notions of what a minimal object is and add lifelike qualities to it, which I bring as a Latin woman growing up in Puerto Rico, I bring that to the table. You know, it's la vida, all the, all the craziness of my childhood growing up in Puerto Rico and in, inject that into the work in a kind of oblique way, because, you know, most people see the work and they, oh okay, yeah, they, they, the referent is light and space, but they don't really know all of the, energy that comes from my heritage that's in there. So it's really been um, 
challenging but rewarding to be able to engage in that process of deconstructing and as I even say decolonizing because I'm the daughter of a colony which is Puerto Rico. I mean Puerto Rico is still a colony mm -hmm. of the US no matter what you want to call it whether it's Estado Libre Asociado, Freely Associated State, the reality is it's a colony. Yeah. And so for me to grow up there, go to Universidad de Puerto Rico and then move here and be able to take on that kind of high level academic endeavor, intellectual endeavor, and break it down and transform it into something new has just been so rewarding. And and I and and again, I've really had a good time doing it. And I'm just really proud um, to be in this show because it's my first Latinx show, you know? And I think I when I when I started looking around, I said, this is such an honor to be amongst all these amazing artists and we all have different um, ways of expressing our ideas and our identity. But one thing is for sure is that even despite all the diversity, we have that underlying connection, which is our Latinidad. And that's the fantastic thing that this show offers. So again, thank you, Beth. We love you <laughs> for putting us all together. And, uh, you know, really appreciate that opportunity to have this dialogue. Thank you so much, Gisela. This was so much fun. I knew it was going to be fun, but it was more fun than I, than I imagined. Yeah. Um, I'm, le I'm leaving with goosebumps and hope for the future and, uh, you know, tying back and thinking about our, 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 our roles in space and nature. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, um, for your creativity and your hope and, and your joy. And I, I just, I love, I, it's, it's, it's a really, really important, really exciting work. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome and uh, pleasure to everybody. Hasta pronto. Thank you for joining us. Right. Ciao. Adios.